Now I am sure many of you have noticed this scripture before. And in Isaiah 59 and the 19th verse, so shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Now, my dear friends, this is a picture from a battlefield. There used to be standards that represent the king who is in the midst of the battle. And there would be standard bearers. And should the standard dip or for any reason be lowered, Oh, it was a signal to the whole army that the commander has fallen. So if the standard dips, it was an ill omen for the whole army. And sometimes they betook themselves to flight. They said, the battle is lost. The standard has fallen. So, this is an image from a battlefield. And... No man who warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of the world, we are told. But you know how neck deep we are in this entanglement today. If you ask some people, they will say it's debts. I'll never get out of debt. If you ask other people, they say, as one young fellow said to me, I asked him after one of my meetings in Dublin, Ireland, hey, why is it that you have got a fully shaven head? Oh, he said, I was working in London, England, and... Uh, I have just come out of prison. And why? Then he went on to tell me, of course, but one of the questions he asked me was, but Mr. Daniel, what do you do? Uh, I was just an unmarried young fellow at that time, or perhaps just married, whatever it is. He said, what do you do? for to overcome this flesh or to answer the needs, as he called it, of the flesh. This is what I did and went to prison. Well, my dear friends, I, for a moment he put me on the spot in the sense that I never thought about such a question. I never did. I said, the Lord Jesus Christ is sufficient for my needs as I travel from place to place. And temptations, of course, abound around me. But that does not mean that I should 
be subject to them and become a victim to them? No. So, my dear friends, there are those of us here who, instead of bearing the standard of the Lord, are hardly able to keep our little agendas afloat. So here's my little standard. This is what I, I must keep afloat. You see, but that cannot be a Christian attitude. Never. How can I be happy when my neighbor is not happy? You know, my dear friends, it is very painful to read how the rotunda, the capital, the houses, the, the House as well as the Senate were used for the preaching of the Word of God. You see, they thought nothing of that. They said, come on, come on in, preach the Word. And today there are voices that say, oh no, that can't be done, shouldn't be done by our Constitution. Never did the writers of the Constitution ever imagine that it is going to be used against the preaching of the Word of God. Never. And the nation set on a godless course. Never. It's a very painful thing as you begin to read some of those things, you know. I find it extremely painful. And when a standard, a great standard, begins to dip, begins to falter and fall, you mean to say there is not a group of people who are concerned? What kind of mercenaries have we got here? People who can be bought up with money, whose God is the dollar. What's the good of having a hundred million such people? No man can serve two masters. That is clear. No man. No preacher, no person can serve two masters. You see how even marriage has become a thing of advantage, where you consider your pros and cons and weigh up every circumstance and financial considerations, and then embark into the noble estate of marriage. What for? To make more money. Is that the end of Christian blessing? Did you ever say, what is the end of the cross? What is the end? All right, the beginning we know, 
a cleansing for our sins and a new nature. But what is the end? That Christ may dwell in you by faith. All right, if Christ is dwelling in you, is it possible to block the effulgence, the radiations of Jesus? You mean to say you're going to be such a blocker that you can block it out? Now, some of these phrases, which are used in the pulpit uh, as mere theological terms, are to me very challenging words. If Christ dwells in me, should Joshua Daniel be seen? How can that be? And all my ugliness be seen? And in a moment of provocation, or in a time of stress, and all my base nature should spring out as in a volcano? What's that? Who is inside? Who is abiding? Is this all a kind of show business when you put on a nice appearance in a conference and uh, carry on that way? Or is it Christ abiding? My beloved people, listen, don't you become, you know, I, I like the word coolie. No, I don't know the word really because I have never been a coolie. A coolie means a man who works for a paltry sum of money. Almost like a slave. And you say, hey, come on, fella. Here's a pit. Come on, dig it. By and by, I'll think about what I'll give you. That's a coolie. And when you get a coolie mind, oh, I'm going to get so much in wages and uh, so on. Some of these coolies hardly know how to make any calculations. And even if they are given a handsome wage, they hardly know how to use it. Their minds have become enslaved. You see, that's what I see in our pews. Minds that are localized, minds that are enslaved, minds that are money-ridden, dirty minds. And when they talk about doing anything for God, I say, forget it. These are not the kind of people that will do a thing for God. It's all big talk. It's religious enthusiasm. They don't care if the standard dips. They only think of their own advantage. My dear friends, listen. That's not discipleship. That is not Christianity. By and large, that is exactly what we are having to see today. 
Do we have people who will be standard bearers when the enemy comes in like a flood? Some of you know the kind of circles in which you work far better than me. Someone told me this morning that a woman, you know, uh, produced a marvelous resume and landed a job for which she was hardly qualified. And then from that point began to climb and climb till she landed herself a very high position. Well, such maneuvering and clambering and uh, such like stuff seems to be possible today. And as you well know, the Eastern mind is geared for that kind of thing. That is the essence of the Eastern mind. And when Jesus saw Nathaniel, Nathaniel, an Israelite in whom there is no guile, no guile, no pretense, no put on whitewash, just plain straight people. How nice, you know, then you can deal with people whose yes is yes and no is no. How simple life becomes. You don't need all this paperwork, this signing and this promissory notes and this, that and the other. I have little use for such things. I have hardly any use for such things because I have to take care of the affairs of a fellowship. Sometimes I have to make sure that the authorities, when they ask for a paper, I must be able to produce that paper. Here is the receipt you want. You see, lest they think that I have pocketed the money or something. Apart from that, you know, I have no use for such things. It makes life so complicated and complex. And then the lawyers have to come in. I like to keep the lawyers out. I won't go into a transaction in, in which a lawyer is needed. <laughs> no, I don't believe in that. Things get only very complicated and also lawyers have their fears. They have got to safeguard their clients. So this could happen, that could happen, and, and the person may default and so on and so forth. And then what do you do? The judge would ask for these papers and so on and so forth. My dear people, how beautiful life becomes when we just live a plain disciple's life. The simplicity of Jesus, it ennobles you. You don't become a petty-minded person just weeping over this trifling thing. There are things to weep over. The floods of ungodliness are deluging and inundating 
the nations and what we are doing is pathetic pathetic why why should it be so what was god's method when uh, the standard of the lord which he lifts up was in danger of drooping in jerusalem or any place what was god's method god's method is the man god's method is you and me that's all that's god's method and you see in the scriptures that's god's method whenever there was failure whenever there was defeat whenever idolatry spread what was god's method god's method was to raise a man all right you mean to say we don't have people who will say lord whatever it may cost i want to be that person i want to be that man what's the purpose of studying the bible all through my life if i am not geared to be that man who is god's method oh it's very very painful you know there is a, a desire for self and there is a there is a leprosy of self you know friends there's a, you know this how elijah turned away the syrian captain after the healing of his leprosy the man had brought enormous wealth and as a token of his gratitude when he offered it to the pro- prophet what did the prophet say is it such a time no i will not take anything of you but you know the mind of elijah's servant was very different in physical proximity closeness elijah's servant he had been with elijah but he had imbibed nothing of that spirit that was in elijah that freedom from materialism let's call it or from or that unworldliness no the he had not imbibed any of it so he said my master has let this man go off scot free now let me go and take something of him so here he was running after the chariot of the syrian captain and uh, the captain alighted oh this man had a story concocted you know friends deceit lies my goodness i don't know how you deal with lies and liars i find i don't know i i have been raised in the midst of godly people no lies and if there were any lies 
there would be a severe judgment from god and uh, so having been brought up in such a manner i find it very difficult when i come up with a liar first i can't believe that the man is saying lies you see lies are is something foreign to me and in god's presence god's company there should be not of course no room for a lie for there is not a lie in heaven and all liars shall have their place in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone all liars so there's no room for lies there's no room for subtle behavior you know there's no room for guile no what a beautiful society where the spirit of the lord is there is liberty that's liberty i don't need to pry into your affairs i don't need to know i don't need to be suspicious that you are trying to do me in oh, or gain an advantage no it's simply not there you don't find that in non christian circles you don't find it in idolatry idolatry is all about gaining advantage over the other person what a what a mindset just the opposite of what jesus gives us you know friends if you don't get rid of that leprosy you know elijah said to this give servant of this this leprosy shall cling to you and to your generations and to your children and that's exactly what some of us are doing we are giving them a leprosy that will cling to them you want me to give a leprosy to my children that is going to cling to them Oh my dear people this is an awful leprosy leprosy of greed leprosy of untruth leprosy of ingratitude leprosy of self gain You know that's all the way you can think you have got a tunnel vision and that's all your eyes will see what do i gain out of this you know one of the most difficult places where the gospel has been greatly resisted is in the impal valley in manipur on the borders of burma and there you know when i started preaching against idolatry and so on they wanted to really hurt me and stone me and so on and so forth but the lord put it in my heart that right there where these things were planned against the gospel right there there should be a testimony for the lord so i do not know if this weekend they are having some 
special gathering, you know. They have suffered a heavy blockade with supplies cut off for over a length, long period. And I really don't know how the poor are able to eat anything. No supplies coming in. The only arterial road cut off by insurgents and anarchists. Well, in that valley, the Hindus, you know, who were very entrenched, they said, all right, this gospel may go to the poor tribes, hill tribes, not the hill tribes. And the hill tribes have their tribal customs, their tribal headmen, and so on and so forth. They, when we started preaching there, it brought us into collision with the strong Hindu forces on the one hand and the strong supposedly Christian forces. Who were these Christian forces? The Christian forces were the tribal people who felt that they had every right to cut off the heads of the other tribes. They had every right. They had a mandate to do it from their forefathers. And Christianity or no religion was going to keep them from their tribal hatred. So this kind of killing was going on. And here we were preaching love. And souls were getting converted from these warring tribes. And all of them were worshipping together. And I would say, I don't want a drop of tribal blood in you. Not a drop of any of that hereditary hatreds. You see, the same which I speak, say of caste, Christ needs to cleanse you of your blood. That family blood of yours is tainted with worldliness, polluted, corrupt. You need the blood of the cross to go through your arteries. My dear people, you know, dealing with such situations, what is the big question that some of them ask? What do we gain by turning to Jesus Christ? What do we gain? My dear friends, the beauty of an inner cleansing that is lost upon the world today. And even the word born again is, has no special connotation in this country. What a sad thing. Born again thieves, born again liars. What, what is that? Born again covenant breakers. 
even the word born again is a matter of frivolity what do you mean born of jesus born into the kingdom of god born into a new nature oh my dear people when the enemy has come in like a flood and god wants to lift up a banner a standard against him are you going to help if you turn to jeremiah 4 chapter and the 6th verse says set up the standard toward zion retire stay not for i will bring evil from the north and a great destruction here jeremiah was actually asking the people to not resist the invader but to go along because here was prophecy being fulfilled and jeremiah had prayed about this uh, for the return of the captivity he had prayed about the return of the captivity if you turn to second chronicles 36th chapter second chronicles 36 last chapter of the book verse 20 and them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to babylon where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of persia to fulfill the word of the lord by the mouth of jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her sabbaths so the word of the lord which jeremiah had prophesied about a rebellious people had come to pass and jeremiah and daniel had prayed for these people interceded you know my dear friends when i talk about intercession my own heart condemns me it grieved the lord that there was no intercessor today we are all a very busy people aren't we and we take great pride in the fact of saying hey i'm far too busy why didn't the lord jesus christ ever say those words wasn't he busy he had only 3 years in which to complete his mission wasn't he busy and do you see our lord being wrought up into a hustle or a bustle and throwing his weight around like you and i do you know do you see any of that no he could take the time with the leper with the blind man with the fallen woman he could take the time but here we are no time for intercession of course we have time to bake we have time to eat we have time to visit we have time for entertainment we have time for everything we have time even for the one-eyed monster we have got time for everything but no time for god 
what a sad state no time for jesus no time for intercession it grieved the lord that there was no intercessor all right but daniel had plenty of time isn't it he had nothing to do he was the first of the presidents you see him in daniel 6 chapter if you will please turn to daniel 6 chapter now when cyrus came to the kingdom and he made a decree and in the decree he said the last words of this chapter and second chronicles was who is there among you of all his people the lord his god be with him and let him go up let him go up the lord stirred up the spirit of cyrus king of persia and he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom what was it go and play ball he made a proclamation <laughs> go and play ball <laughs> you see that's the proclamation that people want today <laughs> Go and play ball. What are you doing here? No, God didn't. Certainly, the King Cyrus had more sense than that. <laughs> He said, "Let them go up to build the broken walls." You know, friends, broken walls. Have you ever surveyed? a place which is hopelessly desolate demolished by a tornado or something and you are so told hey come on now let's rebuild this place and it's got to be better than it was before you think you like it you have to clean up you have to get things ready building is no easy project it apply it takes a lot of your thinking and some of your sleep goes well see that is the way to be real here the king's commandment was let them go up who is there among you who will play the man of course these days we should say who is there among you who will play the girl is it because all men want to play the girl today <laughs> they are more like a girl than they are they feel they have arrived listen the old british phrase says play the man and if people played the man in their families the families would not be where they are people like me who are preachers if we play the man you know today people are torn a friend a one of our brothers in germany told me this he says you know unless that family corrects the children at this the boy at this stage they are going to have endless trouble so i told the girl the mother hey you need to take care of your boy 
You can't let him run around as he pleases. Oh, the mother said, I can't spank him because it is against the EU law, European Union law. <laughs> and this gentleman had the courage to tell her, when the laws of God conflict with the laws of a government, you had better obey the Lord's laws. Yes. So there are many sensible people in the world today who see that indisciplined children are not the ones to run a family. That's not God's way. So, if you turn to the sixth chapter of Daniel, they said, you know, they said, no, we can't find any fault in this man unless it is something concerning the law of his God. The fifth verse. We can't find any fault with this man. So they got the king to sign that horrible decree, senseless decree. Thirty days, nobody should pray to anybody except the king. What rubbish. We are coming very close to that nowadays. You see? You, you owe nothing to anybody except the country or something. Whatever. Look at Daniel's reaction. Tenth verse. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened towards Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed as before. His windows being opened. You know, friends, being open witnesses of the Lord is a costly business today because we are marked as fanatics, fools, hate mongers. What we hate, do we, when we preach against homosexuality, they are trying to promulgate laws all over, calling it hate laws. Is it hatred? Teaching the word of God, is it hatred? Saving people from AIDS, is it hatred? Saving people from early death, is it hatred? No. I would like to be in a case where a judge hails me up and says, you're a hate monger. I'd like to tell me, tell you, tell him, sir, the average life expectancy of a man in the United States is upwards of 74. Now it could be slightly higher. And the life expectancy of a homosexual is about half. 
early 40, 40s. So if I keep a man from dying 35 years early, is that hit? Or is that love? Do I get anything for my trouble? No. Everybody scoffs. Everybody laughs. Everybody calls me a fanatic. But I don't care. You throw me into prison, throw me where, wherever. This is a miscarriage of justice. Now that is, the, that is how our countries are being run today. Right is not right and wrong is not wrong. Wrong is right and right is wrong. And you and I are supposed to cringe and say, okay, okay, that's fine. I'll kowtow. Not me. What a sad day. And Daniel did not kowtow to this. The Lord will lift up a standard. And what was the eventual declaration of this same king? 26th verse. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. I want all sportsmen here to tell me, all those who love sport. You know, I, I love sport. I have loved sport, but not this kind of sport where you catch hold of the fellow's shirt and trip him up huh? just before he shoots a goal. What kind of nonsense is that? Is that sport? That's not sport. You don't waste your time with such hooligans and bums. You catch a man by his shirt and pull him? What nonsense is that? And the referee is afraid he would run, run out of all the red cards. So he gives them sparingly. <laughs> That's not the way soccer is to be played, or any game for that matter. Now tell me, does that kind of thing compare anywhere with a king recognizing that is everyone in my kingdom should tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and steadfast forever. As, and his kingdom which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. Ten years after, I would like to see how well some of these beer gobblers play the game. They will have such big pot bellies, they will be hardly able to move.
My friends, listen, which would be greater? To bring the truth of God upon a nation or just say, hey, I've got a medal here. I've got a cup here. And I held on to that position for barely four years. Barely four years. All right. If you're a good sportsman, you will be also a person who says, I will play far better for Jesus. What a decree. Every man in my kingdom should know. And I will lift up a standard. Let us pray. Let us tell God. Lord, when the standard appears to be drooping and people have not got the courage to even squeak and judges are carrying the law right into the sewage pool. Lord, at such a time, have mercy upon us, we pray. Let us not be just like barking dogs, just yelping a little and then sleeping away. Oh, my Father, give us the diligence that was in a Jeremiah, the prayer that was in a Daniel, to reverse these horrible trends. Lord, hear our prayer and lift up a standard against this tide of evil. We want to do our part. I dare not die before I do a little part. Oh Lord, my God, have mercy on these dear people, every one of them. They have a part to play in lifting high the standard. The battle is not lost. The standard shall never droop. We shall carry this battle forth and show forth that Jesus is Lord. Please give us this great privilege, Lord, to show you to this lost world. Give us this privilege and give your children, some of your children are far more faithful, far more unworldly than many of us. Some of your hidden children who are prayer warriors, Lord, bless them, be with them, wherever they are. Some who have suffered far, far more than anything that we have suffered. Please, Lord, be with them, I pray. The Lord shall lift up a standard against the flood of evil. Do it, Lord, do it and use even people like us in Jesus' holy name. Amen.